This is going to be a, a mixture of two things. This will be an amusing bit, followed by a, a hopefully a thought-provoking couple of moments. Um, so the question is going to be, how did I become historical consultant for Making War Horse the movie? Well, the answer is really quite simple. Uh, back in 2010, I heard that they were going to turn Michael Morpurgo's uh, book uh, which was then a play into a movie, and I got on the phone and had a quick word with Stephen, uh, my mate. In well, I didn't. That's not why I thought. Um, I, I realised they were making the film, and I wanted to be involved. My background is historical events, it's reenactments, it's First World War stuff. What do I know about horses? A lot less than my daughter who rides them, but I thought I'd have a go. And um, I happened to speak to Simon Atherton, who runs a company, provides firearms for, for films. And I said I was really interested in it. And he said, oh, well, that's quite interesting. I, I think we'll be get able to get you along to the studio. Well, I knew what that meant. I, I, I'd seen all of the films. Uh, that would mean Heathrow, 747, first class, champagne before we took off, do what you're taxiing, fly to LA, go see Steven Spielberg, Brief interview, get the job, jet set lifestyle, no problem. Studio is in fact Long Cross, which is the junction of the M3 and the M25. <laughs> Trench sequence, Wisley, which is the junction of the A3 and the M25. Hospital sequence, Luton. <laughs> the big sequence with marching in the hill and all of that was Bournewood where they filmed Gladiator. But anyway, the, the point is I wasn't involved yet. So I went along and I was called to this meeting at Long Cross and it was a bit like here. Now there was a big room and all the heads of department were there. And I could see them needing lots of heads of department. That They'd need somebody in charge of casting, someone in charge of filming and sound and makeup and props and costume and things. But I had no idea how many jobs there are in the movie industry. And it was when looking at people's little name tags, when it said equine makeup team. And you, think, you know, how much lipstick and blusher does a horse need? That I realized that I was actually out of my depth. And then it got worse because they said to me, we're actually going to give you the screenplay to look at. Michael Morpurgo had written the book, but turning it into a movie is a skill, and this was going to be done by Richard Curtis. And they said, we'll send you a copy of the screenplay. And I waited for it to come through the letterbox, and nothing happened. And then there was a knock at the door. I opened the door, and there's a guy there with a black suit on, black tie, black limousine with an envelope. I thought someone had died. And he said, are you Mr. Robert Shaw? I said, yes, I am. He said, will you please make sure that this is your screenplay? And I looked at the envelope and it said, Mr. Robert Shaw. I said, it's my screenplay. He said, no, no, no. Open it, please, sir. I opened it. Every single page was watermarked with my name. And I was told if any of that screenplay appeared anywhere in the world before the movie came out, I would get fired if I got the job. And very importantly, I wouldn't get paid. I was also told that if anybody took a photograph during the making of the movie and it was then used anywhere in the world media, whoever took it would get fired and you wouldn't get paid. But I was lucky. What I'd actually done is I'd stumbled into, in the meeting, a man called Adam Sumner, who was the assistant director. And he actually just stood literally at the end of a meeting like this and just said to me, Andy, um, what colour is British smoke? What colour is German smoke? How does gas work? What does it look like? And I answered the questions, and Simon, my friend, stood there. And at the end of it, I said to um, Simon, what was that? He said, that was your interview. I went, well, have I got the job? He said, I don't know. You better go ask him. And I went upstairs to find Adam Sumner, who just moved into this new office at Long Cross Studio. And I said, excuse me, Adam, um, do you want me to see me again? He said, not really, unless you've got an agent. I said, I'll get an agent. He said, you've got the job. And that was how it works in the movie industry. It's very much who you know, and I suppose a bit of what you know. And what they then said is, right, what we're going to do is to get you to train the extras how to be correct soldiers. Now, I've never served in the military, but I know an awful lot about German foot drill and British foot drill and what's right and what's wrong, and that's what I was going to be there for. But the important word is the word consultant. Notice the word consultants, yeah? They will consult you if they want to know. As you'll discover, 
they don't always want to know. Or if you want to give them an answer, it's best to not give it unless they actually ask for it. But what then happened was, and this gets really quite interesting, is it was decided that actually um, I should be in the movie. This is me. And the photograph was taken by the um, uh, uniform department to make sure that I looked equally badly dressed on day three as I did on day one, as we did this recruiting sequence at Castle Coombe, which you might be aware of isn't actually in Devon, where the movie's set. But of course, that's the magic of the movie industry. Uh, funnily enough, about uh, a year and a half later, I went back to Castle Coombe and I parked the car. We were having a, a meeting with media about the release of the DVD and I realised that someone had stolen half the village. The reason for that is that I'd never been to Castle Coombe in my life. I'd spent a week working in the village and didn't realise that half of it was artificial. All the modern telephone kiosks, all the modern buildings were all concealed behind fascias so you couldn't see it. But they got me to appear as a recruiting officer for the Army Service Corps. Why? Because at the time I was the director of the Royal Logistic Corps Museum, the successor to the Army Service Corps. But by that stage I'd already spent about five weeks working with these guys who are not flies, they are in fact German soldiers, where there's some of my team of extras dressed as Germans. And I had to teach them how to come to attention as British soldiers, how to march as British soldiers, not to do any of that modern foot stamping stuff, all the rest of those things. And at the same time, to do something similar for the British soldiers. Now, you might be aware that I've just shown you two pictures that theoretically I can't have. But it's all down to this guy here, who in fact you might have met. He actually worked for a company called Starbucks. He's what's called a barista. I understand the course for barristers is slightly longer. The important thing is that what we're he doing here is here at the home of the Duke of Wellington, Stratfield Say, and this guy had actually been working at the um, uh, Starbucks in Camp Bastion in Afghanistan. He was an ex-American Marine who was desperate to be involved in the movie. And although he didn't tell me, he took a camera with him on location every single day. And this is why I can do this talk. And if you look in the background, you'll see some of our equine friends. So we have vehicles, we have houses, we have soldiers, and of course, we're going to have Lots and lots and lots of horses. About 130 horses on any one day. And every single day that we were on location, we had people from the American Blue Cross to make sure that no animals were injured in the making of the movie. And they checked on everything. But this is going to be a bit of a surprise for you. Because um, this is the camp which is attacked during the um, <coughs> big cavalry charge. The most important thing about this is that the original tents are that size. <coughs> the tents that they built for the movie are that size. Why? Because they weren't impressive enough. I wrung my hands and said that they're wrong. They said they won't work, not least being at least one horse has to run through a tent. No horse can run through that one unless it's my little pony. So straight away, you're making compromises. And one of the big compromises is this. You see, that is the crew looking at us in the camp. You're always aware it's the 21st century. No way can you suspend disbelief if you're making a movie. I'll give you some ideas why. One, this horse here is Joey. This is one of the... Oh, sorry. Damn, damn, I said one of the Joeys. I mean, this is the Joey. No, yeah, I can't do that. There are 13 Joeys. Three of them are robots. One of them is a baby Joey, one's a bigger Joey. And if you think that's a surprise, when you watch the sequence in the film, when little baby Joey is taken away from his mum, his mum rears up to show, I'm an unhappy kind of horse. And probably says something like, don't take my little boy. Actually, he'd probably say, don't take my boy. Because if you look very carefully in a certain place, you'll find that Joey's mum's actually a gelding. 
you don't necessarily get what you think you get. And in fact, when the movie came out, uh, what happened was uh, somebody in the audience, a bit like this, at the end of it, said, um, what did you think of the John Williams soundtrack? I said, well, it's very nice. He said, didn't you get bored with it? Sorry, when would we have got bored with the John Williams soundtrack? He said, oh, you know, when you were filming it. I went, they don't play it through loudspeakers. <laughs> It comes on afterwards. But of course, the thing about the equine makeup team, and the reason that we have both Joey and Topthorn being thoroughbreds, is they had to have ten, and in the case of Topthorn, six real horses that would match. Which means that that horse had to have the same white blaze and the same white socks in every sequence. But those horses could only work about half a day. Why? Horses get bored. They have a very, very low attention span. And after a while, they have to go off and go to their Winnebago or some other caravan and have a lesson from a tutor. I don't know what they do. But whereas my extras could do 14-hour days, these things did about six hours. But of course, you soon learn. And we soon learn that, for example, there are big problems in the movie industry. The battle sequence was meant to be in beautiful weather. As you can see here, it was pretty bad in August 2010. And very importantly, we've got a little black speck there. Now you might think that actually is a fly very close to. It isn't. It's actually a light aircraft quite high up. And we were being buzzed by light aircraft trying to get photographs of making the movie. The problem with that is... There you've got Benedict Cumberbatch, whoever he is, about to give his lines, and a light aircraft goes bzzz behind you. It's rubbish. We had to get a court order to get rid of the aircraft. And very importantly, we were very lucky. Steven Spielberg's very powerful, but he can't influence the weather. So eventually, the weather got better, and we were able to make the cavalry charge. Now, anybody who knows anything about cavalry in the Great War will say, hang about, they're quite well dressed, they're holding, holding their swords rather badly in this sequence, and um, they seem a bit thin on kit. Where's the extra bandoliers of ammunition? Where are the shoe cases? Where is the greatcoats? Where's the hay nets? The answer is, on the day that we eventually got good enough weather to film this sequence, all the cavalry turned up without the extra kit. Adam Sumner said to me, Andy, is this right? I said, no, it isn't. Why is it like this? I said, I don't know. I have not given instructions for this to be like this. They spoke to the prop department who said, ah, oh, well, if it was a real cavalry charge, they wouldn't have bothered. Whoops. Adam said to Steven Spielberg, this is wrong. Steven Spielberg said, we don't have time. We will film it as it is. Tens of thousands of pounds worth of kit sat in shipping containers and were never used. And you realize that actually on location, each of the departments is a law unto itself, and none of them really cooperate. But of course, we needed to have some dead horses. And of course, they're quite difficult to get hold of, especially following the business with the Findus lasagna. Therefore, they had to make artificial horses. And they're actually made of foam rubber. They're covered in a kind of furry uh, mat that looks just like real fur. They've all died with their eyes closed. There's only one problem with them. Although they come in different varieties and they've got nice shiny hooves, they look very good and you dress them in the appropriate kit, they're incredibly light. On one occasion, we were caught by a little gust of wind and two of the dead horses blew away. <laughs> On another occasion, when I came back from lunch, my extras, and here they are, had taken eight of them, laid them in a circle, and were sat on them playing cards. <laughs> I wasn't certain that Mr. Mopogo would approve of that. But then we moved to here, which is Wisley. And this is the airfield, the old airfield, uh, where they used to be able to land really large aircraft. But they'd moved 28,000 tons of earth to build the trench. That's a lot of earth, isn't it? The reason for that is they'd actually built a big U-shaped bank. I suspect it's so that when you flew from Heathrow and looked down, you could see a kind of motif of a horseshoe. No. 
The real reason was so that when we were filming or our trench sequence, and the camera came round showing the big attack, it wouldn't pick up the white transit van on the A3. More importantly, the guy driving the white transit van on the A3 wouldn't go, look at that, that's Spielberg, and drive into a tree. So we're actually inside a bank. And as you'll see, I'm now in modern clothes, although my extras are still in uniform, here being Germans. This led to a problem, so they said in the end, look, it's not working with you on the outside being called in when we need you. We need you to be available at all times. That means wearing uniforms. Well, you can imagine, I was heartbroken because I was now being paid for as a consultant and an extra on the same day. And it meant that I ended up looking like this. Uh, this is the world's oldest stormtrooper. This is um, actually the German army sponsored by Sanatogen. Um, but the important thing is that behind me, apparently, is a nice brick arch. Well, it's not. Now, look, I still cannot tell you what the best boy or the chief grip does, but I'll tell you now what the standby plasterers do. Basically, they eat pizza, they smoke cigarettes, and they drink coffee. But when this stuff gets chipped, it's actually painted plaster. They fix it. So the next time you're watching the credits and it comes down, wait for the standby plasterers. They are incredibly useful people to know because clearly you can't film unless you put it right. But what they built is this, and this is superb. This is an evocation, really, of the battles in the Eep salient. Shattered trees, shell holes, water, superb. Unfortunately, the battle we were meant to be showing was the Battle of Amiens in August 1918 on chalky soil. Anyone see a problem? And I mentioned it, and I said, look, you know, why does it look like this? And somebody looked at me sympathetic like I was an idiot or a small child and said, look, if we don't do it like this, people won't understand it's meant to be the First World War. Isn't that interesting? We have to have trenches with shell holes and lots of water, otherwise we think it's in the wrong war. But sometimes it was very realistic. These are um, dead rats. And that particular morning, I'd noticed that on the call sheet, it mentioned the word rat wranglers. And I thought they'd turn up two big hulking blokes, Stetsons, chaps, whips. No, two little old ladies with two cages with six brown rats in each. And they sat and had their breakfast with the rats under the table. But I got on the location, and then actually got these hung up. Now, they're clearly dead rats. And I said to one of the prop people, oh, where have these come from, these rats? And he said, get stuffed. And I said, same to you, mate. And he went, no, it's a company called Get Stuffed. They specialised in stuffed animals for movie industry. And he said, do you know what? These ones actually, sorry, I did that one. These animals actually are um, freeze-dried. And we can do any animal you like up to the size of a tiger. And I was going to ask him, how do you lure the tiger into the freezer? But I didn't bother in the end. Anyway, what happened was that the rats were released in the sequence with the gas. And they run down the trench. And um, then they went, oh, did we get that? Not really. The rats run a bit quicker than we thought. Ooh, can we slow the rats down? No. Well, we'll change how we film it. And they found 10 of them. So they did it again. More gas, same rats. We had eight. They did it again. We had six. I'd like to think that about now, somewhere near Wisley, are six rats saying, have you heard from your agent, mate? I've not heard a word from mine. Because they never came back. They're somewhere out there with the wild rats. Oh, by the way, you know I mentioned about this company that makes the dead rats and the dead animals being called Get Stuffed? You'll never guess what the company's called that makes fake snow for the movie industry. It's called snow business. As in, there's no business without snow business? Who says they don't have a sense of humour? And they certainly did have a sense of humour when it came to this. Because um, this is um, me in the sequence when somebody actually um, has to um, blow a whistle. And um, 
I'd um, been called forward and Steven Spielberg said to me, Andy, we want you to blow the whistle today to send the men over the top. And I said, well, that, that won't be difficult. I'll just kind of get on the ladder, blow the whistle. He went, no, 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 no. It's not that simple. Let's see how long this lead is. What we want you to do is this. We want you actually to start off in a trench with a bagpiper. Now, if you look here, you'll see the word Dorset. Now, in my knowledge of these things, I don't believe that Dorset is famous for bagpipes. But if Steven Spielberg wants a bagpiper, there will be a bagpiper. And what I want you to do, Andy, is we want you to go forward like this one, walk along following the bagpiper, and when you get to about here, you'll stop and you'll look at your colleague, the other officer, who will have a watch. He will look at the watch to indicate to you it is time for you to turn and go over the top. Is that clear? Not a problem. So, however, whatever happens, you must not nod to acknowledge the fact it's time. Now, can I point out, if somebody like Steven Spielberg speaks to two non-actors and says, whatever you do, don't nod, you know what's going to happen, don't you? <laughs> then he said to me, Andy, I know you've got a stick and a pistol, but what I want you to do is I want you to climb onto the ladder, holding the stick and the pistol, put the whistle in your mouth, and then blow the whistle as you look over the camera. I kind of looked a bit shocked. He went, okay, put the stick through your belt, hold the whistle in your mouth, revolver in your hand, climb the ladder with your left hand, it'll be fine. But you must not look at the camera, you must not look under the camera, you must look over the camera, blow the whistle. Is that clear? Yes. We now have about 400 soldiers waiting to go. We've got pyrotechnics. We have everything. It is 9.30 in the morning. All we have to do is film it. And ahead of me is a big camera. And there are other cameras covering all the angles. I am remarkably calm. Why? Because I didn't know I was doing it until 20 minutes earlier. Had someone told me I was doing it, I probably would not have been there that morning. So, we set off. We walk. We get to here. There's a crash. The guy at the back has fallen over in the mud. We go back. Now, you're going to say, well, that's easy, isn't it? Oh, no, it isn't. Because the camera has to go back to where it went to to start with. That camera is on a 120-foot boom. We get ourselves ready. We set off again. I get further... There's an even bigger crash than before because, you see, up there, there's a guy on a ladder. Can you see the guy on the ladder? He has decided to look back and see how far we've got without realising the ladder isn't fixed. He's now lying in the bottom of the trench under a ladder with first aiders. We do it again. It is now 11-ish. Things are not looking good. I'm clearly working with incompetent people. I get to here. I walk along. I get to here. I get to my standing position. And there's a noise. Now, if you're going to play bagpipes, one of the things you have to do is to blow them up. If you actually start with a bag empty, it takes time. And in the movie, you're not going to have time. Therefore, the bag has to be inflated. So what's happened is the bagpiper has set off a quite a lick with the bagpipes all blown up ready to start when I blow the whistle. What he hasn't realised is that the ground where he's going to stop is very muddy. And his feet went from under him. But of course, to save himself and his bagpipes, what he does is he squeezes them. <laughs> it sounded like this. Ah! We go back and we do it again. It is now after 11 and things are looking really bad. We get to here, we get to here, we get to here, we get to here. My colleague, Richard, now looks at his watch. I look at him. He nods. <laughs> the walk of shame. But it's not my fault. They're all incompetent. Give me decent actors. John Gilgood would do, but not these people. We do it again. I am willing Richard not to let me down. He doesn't do. He looks at me. It's time, he doesn't say. But he looks at those eyes. I am so pleased. I nod. <laughs> we do it again. 
It is now definitely lunchtime. I get on the ladder. I have the whistle in my mouth. But I can't hold it with my hand because I've got a revolver in this hand. And the other hand's holding the ladder and I have to look over the camera, look suave and sophisticated, well, in my dreams, and blow the whistle. It basically goes... <laughs> <laughs> Steven Spielberg says, don't worry, we can dub it on. I said, please, can we have one last chance? And at one o'clock, we do the whole thing. We storm up the ladders. There's enormous explosions. We are all keyed up. And then someone shouts, cut, lunch. What? <laughs> what? It's not real. It's a movie. We go and have lunch. And then the war continues after that. And that's the point about all of this. It's not like you imagine. We get ourselves into no man's land, which, as you can see, is littered with fire engines and ambulances, which really does not give you much confidence, believe me. Oh, and a dead horse. No, I don't know why either. You're probably wondering what the red thing is there. That's a calopropane uh, cylinder, so we can keep the fires going to make it even more authentic. By the way, when we set off across here, I noticed bullets hitting the water. And in a little break, I went to speak to Adam and... Um, so, why did it do that one? Okay, sorry. Right, okay. I went to speak to Adam and the others and said, why are there bullets hitting the water? And they said, don't worry, it's not real bullets. They're paintballs. I went, yeah, but they're coloured. They went, no, we use plain ones, clear ones. Oh, I said, that's all right, because I was a bit worried. Anyway, um, Simon said to me, I'll show you in the next take. And we literally came up over the top, went through the water. I'm wading through water, and I noticed to my right a bullet strike, then another bullet strike, then another bullet strike, then another bullet strike. And somebody who actually got the DVD said, you know that scene where you get shot in the leg? Oh, it was ever so realistic. Too right it was. It hit me right on the kneecap. And I stopped being paid as an extra because I was now officially dead. But then they did the sequence with a horse in the dark. Now you're probably wondering how they did this. The answer's simple. They brought in one of the Joeys I'd never seen before. Why not? Because he was stone deaf. But very difficult to work with. In fact, we were told this particular horse would quite cheerfully bite your face off. So when you see people in the trench, when the horse runs down it going, Ooh! Scared. We are scared. We really are scared. But be aware that the horse that gets wrapped in the barbed wire is an animatronic. It's a robot. And one of the great things about that was that we had a number of robots. One of them was a three-quarter height horse that could move. It had four people operating it. People responsible for the eyes, the ears, the neck. And one of the makeup girls came up to one of the Joeys and said, could I pat Joey on the nose? And the team went, if you like. And she put her hand out, and the horse put its head round, came round behind her, and bit her on the bum. And she said, um, why did Joey do that? And one of the lads went, Joey didn't. <laughs> but we'd already hit another problem. And that problem was the question of mud. Obviously, you've got to have mud on horses, in the same way as it would appear that you have to have... Um, Random poppies. But anyway, the trouble with the mud is they'd use real mud to start with, and all that happened was it dried and fell off. So they had to invent a special mud that would stick to the horses. That meant that the equine makeup team were now getting up about two hours before anybody else to do the mud makeup, and then the horses were then doing their little bit, and then the mud makeup came off at the end of the day. Their days were 14 hours by this point. And then we get this. And this is just an idea about what it looked like. This is early evening. And you really are pretty close to what it might have been like. And then, of course, we've got this horse. Now, this particular Joey had been trained to walk in circles. You're thinking, why would you get a horse to walk in circles? Well, the answer is, it was taught to walk in circles, watching the whip until the whip went up, then it ran in a straight line, and it ran straight towards a replica of the replica tank. 
And then the horse would jump over the tank bum, 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 and run away. Which meant that when we came to do the filming, when we came to do the filming, go backwards, sorry. When we come to the filming, what happens is, here is our um, Joey walking in circles. The tank comes along for real, and then it tips into a shell hole. At the point that the tank tips into the shell hole, the horse sees the whip disappear, sees his friendly fake tank, which he's jumped over a thousand times, run towards the tank, which is now stationary, the thump, the thump, off it goes. Six cameras, one horse, one tank, one take. This was a one-take wonder. Now, can I point something out? Andy's filming seven takes. Joey's filming one take. Did Andy get an Oscar? No. Did Joey the horse? No. I think we're quits. Uh, by the way, the tank has now been bought by Bovington Tank Museum. Um, and then we went up to um, Luton, where we filmed the hospital sequence, which, as you can see, the extras found very tiring. Um, and this is where they were going to shoot the horse being Joey that night outside the hospital. Quite why you'd shoot a horse that could walk outside the hospital door, I don't know, but that was the plan. The horse had been wrapped in barbed wire, been rescued, now wasn't very well. Let's shoot the horse, said someone. But Albert Narricot, played by Jeremy Irvin, reckons is his horse, but he's blind. So he says, if you look, you'll find it's got four white socks and a white blaze. Trouble is, the horse is covered in mud. So in the middle of the night, during a night shoot, Steven Spielberg says to the actor, all you do now is you reach into that bucket there, you take a big sponge out, and you wash the mud off. The woman in charge of the equine makeup team was behind him going, huh, um, uh, uh, what's wrong, he said. It won't wash off, she says. We haven't developed it to wash off. You want it to stick on the horses, not wash off. And he went, go away. Get me a joey with real mud, bring it back here, you've got 30 minutes. Because it was costing tens of thousands of pounds to have a crew doing nothing. And that's exactly what happened. But it shows how you can plan and still not get it quite right. And then we moved here. This is the Bourne Wood. This is where they'd filmed Gladiator, where they'd filmed some of the Robin of Sherwood, and there was a prisoner of war camp. There was loads of Germans, there was loads of horses, there was a horse butcher that never appears in the movie because it was felt it might upset people. Although actually, thinking about it, product placement, Findus would have sponsored this. <laughs> there were doctors, and there was an absolutely enormous artillery piece. Now, can I be honest and tell you two things? One, that artillery piece does not need to be at the top of a hill to fire. It's better off at the bottom of the hill but if you're going to have horses pull it up the hill, it has to go up the hill, doesn't it? Next thing, horses never pull guns that big. Why not? They can't. But that's the marvel of the movie industry. They can in a movie. And they're actually going to pull that gun up that hill, which later, actually, in a previous life, had had the, uh, the, the sheriff of Nottingham's castle on it, but that's another story. Here is my camera with the big boom. Here is all the tents for Spielberg and his entourage. And to make it more authentic, we add a very small amount of fire. It's about 120 meters long, and it's fired from a flamethrower. And what it means is that when you watch it, you've actually got your groups of horses, men, and an enormous fire, and they're a firefighter trying to stop Bourne Wood from burning down. There is the camera. And running right down the middle of my hill is a black mark. That is a big steel hollow beam, inside which is a hawser fastened to a winch, and underneath the gun is a pin. And when you see the horses struggling and the men pushing, it's called acting. <laughs> They're not really doing anything. And one of the sad bits in the film here is when one of the horses, a grey, isn't trying very hard, so to encourage the other, the others, a, a German officer shoots one of the horses, the grey. 
Quite how that's going to encourage the others, I don't know. I'm not certain how much uh, logic horses can apply to this kind of thing. You can imagine them going, just shot Bessie, better try harder. Horses don't do that. Anyway, I was now in civilian clothes, and very close to the guy in charge of the prop departments. The grey horse was led away, never to appear again, because it's now dead. And uh, he says on his microphone system uh, to the prop department, Hello, it's Kevin here. Yeah, up on the hill. <clears throat> They're just short horse. We need a dead one. What colour? It's a grey one. Sorry? You haven't got a grey horse. Where is it? It's still at Stratfield Say. What are the colours you got? You've got a brown one. Brown, bay. They'll not notice. Watch the film. As Top Thorn runs up to be helpful, followed by Joey, they're dragging away a dead horse that's suddenly gone from being grey to being brown. <laughs> oh, by the way, in the sequence where Top Thorn dies, if you were there, it's funny. They train the horse to simply lie down when you tapped it on the shoulder. It would just collapse. But the horse that they used was incredibly idle. And I said, what, what makes it so good for this sequence? They went, listen and watch. The horse collapses. The German goes, oh no, don't die, my beauty, or something, and the German gun away. And the horse is incredibly idle and can fall asleep in a few seconds. So if you watch the whole sequence of Topthorn dying, because he actually dies when his eyes close, horses don't do that, but that's in the movie. If you'd been there on location, you would have heard the following. <laughs> as he fell asleep. <laughs> so when in the movie, people go, oh, it's so moving, oh, he's died. No, he hasn't, he's having a kip. <laughs> and we rehearsed and we practiced on this hill for 10 days, and in the whole movie, it's four minutes. 10 days of your life, a four minutes movie. And then what happened was this. We filmed the last sequence. Now, in the movie, this sequence is about a third of the way in. These soldiers here are dressed for 1914. In the movie, this is about a third of the way in. And here's the last thing that we film. So don't ever think they film things in order. They don't. But I knew that this was probably going to be the last day of filming. It was getting close. It was a Friday. And if you, madam, were going to be Adam Sumner, you might say at the end of a day's filming on a Monday... That's a wrap. In the old days, that was rewind and print so we could check the movie before we did the next day's filming. You might be Tuesday, you might be Wednesday, you might be Thursday. In this case, if you're Steven Spielberg, hi Stevie baby, you are only going to say that's a wrap on the very last day of filming. And I was desperate to be there. I'd worked with these guys for now for about 16 weeks. And Steven Spielberg had said very early on, this film isn't a war film. Remarkable, isn't it? It's not a war film. It's a film about comradeship. And I've never served, but I'd now had a bond with these guys. And my brigadier, Brigadier Murray, asked to see me. And I went to see the brigadier, because I was still working for the museum. And he said, how's the filming going? I went, it's going very well, sir. He went, my wife's looking forward to seeing the movie. She's really keen to see how it's going. I said, I've not been funny, sir, but would it be all right if I kind of left, because I actually am on leave today, because I want to be there when they do the last bit of filming. He went, oh, you should have said. Off you go. Get in the car, drive to Bournewood, get in the shuttle bus, and I'm still in the shuttle bus when this happens. That is Steven Spielberg, surrounded by my extras. All my extras had their photographs taken with Steven Spielberg. Who didn't? <laughs> I was still on the bloody bus. And when I met these guys, they were walking back and they were saying, that's it, we'll never do this again. And of all the things I could have been involved in, this was a, a film about comradeship. It is not historically perfect. To my certain knowledge, no British private soldier ever manages to buy his horse back from the army in pounds, shillings and pence in Cambrai. And even if he did, he couldn't afford to ship it home, but it's a lovely story. But the other thing about it is I've sat in audiences all over the UK of people normally of a horsey disposition of a certain age and gender who would not normally would you expect to go see a film about the First World War. 
And that has done a marvellous job for us. Because it's so many more people are now aware about the role of horses in the First World War because of what you're doing, because of the book and the play and now the movie. If any of you in the audience has got someone in your family in the movie industry and they want a struggle consultant, my name's Andy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for listening. This is my poem called War Horse, which actually was inspired by Amy's marvellous statue. When I saw the pamphlet of it, um, I started scribbling this poem and worked on it for a couple of months, and this is the outcome. Trooper McConnell remembered the thrill when he sat on her back for their very first drill. The large, trusting eyes, the white blaze on her face, the way that she moved with such elegant grace. She had just a number, he thought that a shame, so he christened her Sadie, his own sister's name. His passion for horses began as a lad, where he lived on the farm with his sister and dad. The army had offered a good steady wage, and like many, he lied when they asked him his age. They were posted to France in the spring of 15, when Declan McConnell was just 17. Sent up to the front on their very first day, they were soon at a place in the thick of the fray. The men called it Wipers, although truth to tell, a better name for it might well have been Hell. The call for the big push came early that day, and the squadron was mounted and soon on its way. Led by the colonel, they galloped along, to a hill where the gunfire was loud and prolonged. Declan patted his horse's mane, called in her ear, Come, Sadie, my beauty, we'll show them no fear. Once over the ridge they were soon in the fight, with horses and men going down left and right. A sudden wild lunge, Sadie whinnied with pain, and Declan was thrown, but he clung to her rein. He was dragged along briefly as Sadie limped on, but she stumbled and fell and he knew she was gone. He cradled her head as they lay in the mud, his copious tears now mixed with her blood. He whispered his love for her, called her his queen, the most beautiful lady there ever had been. She gave a last gasp, the whole body shook, and the eyes that stared back had an unseeing look. As he knelt by her side to say his farewell, he was struck in the chest, and he died where he fell. In his pocket, they found his last letter home. It said, none of us knows of what is to come, but in Sadie, I found a true loving friend who'll fight and stay with me right to the end. Thank you.